All right, well, welcome everyone to Vapor Barriers. Do we really need them? This course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, GBCI, DPI, uh, as well as AIA, health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license, and then pending uh, FIAS, um, uh, passive house certification as well. Um, today, I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the program manager here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Again, we're going to be going through vapor barriers, what's important, what you need to know, and um, what you can do from here to learn more. And before we get started, a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, Mitsubishi. Um, Mitsubishi has uh, ductless mini splits that can now be hidden in many different ways, uh, as well as ducted systems when needed. The ducted systems are hidden behind the walls to ensure a beautiful space and can be retrofitted right in place of an existing furnace or multifamily project. They have uh, dry mode, so when cooling is not needed as much, it can help remove excess humidity in some of their applications. H2I plus hyperheating um, is the leading technology in the industry. Uh, outdoor units produce 100% heating capacity all the way down to negative five degrees, giving a warm and comfortable environment even in sub-zero temperatures. Uh, the patented Mitsubishi electric dual barrier coating prevents dust and dirt accumulation in the inner surface of the heat pump, keeping your indoor unit clean year-round. A cleaner coil means uh, easier maintenance and high efficiency for heat pump systems. And then the 3D eye sensor, an infrared ray sensor that measures temperature at different positions throughout the space, uh, can be used to help um, detect occupancy and uh, heat and cool the space as needed to reduce uh, power consumption in unoccupied uh, spaces. Make sure to get with their diamond contractors if you're looking to start a project. They have uh, the expertise and the knowledge in the background uh, to get uh, to install their systems as well as include the warranties. Um, a little more information, uh, you know, again, uh, back to uh, customized comfort. Um, if you want to go all electric and be energy efficient, using systems like this, uh, you can heat and cool different rooms as needed. Um, I've got one of these systems and back to the hyperheat selection, you know, back, yeah, and I was just talking about this before the session started, back in February when it got really cold here, um, despite that, I still had heat kicking out, still coming from the air uh, within, my, uh, within my system. So we know these systems work, we know that they work in some of the coldest uh, frigid uh, climates. And then if you're doing multifamily, you can get a commercial centralized variable refrigerant flow or VRF system. Uh, which works great on larger projects looking to serve whole buildings and include ventilation if needed. Go check all this out at MitsubishiComfort.com. And thanks to our second tier sponsor, Rockwool. Uh, traditionally here in Michigan, you see rigid foam on exterior of homes, but I was really excited to be working on this project here for a LEED V4.1 home where the owners really wanted to ensure improved environmental performance in all the materials they picked. And so they utilized uh, Rockwell rigid insulation on the exterior of the home, and that's a photo of the project we were working on. Rockwell has insulation from top to bottom, including under the slab and foundation walls. Check them out over at rockwell.com. All right, well, I'm excited to uh, introduce our speakers today. Um, Dan uh, Edelman has been on with us three or maybe four times now uh, as of this session, so it's always great to have him back. He uh, has been in the built environment for 20 years, beginning as a project manager in large commercial projects, and now working primarily with residential designers, builders, and contractors. He's been with uh, Rockwell for almost 10 years and works with builders, contractors, and architects nationwide, offering solutions to issues um, common in the building envelope. And then also our co-speaker here, Randy, who works uh, mostly for other contractors and homeowners, helping them with design in their projects, uh, with building science-based assemblies, and occasionally gets the chance to install some of the projects he specifies. For some reason, Randy enjoys installing uh, WRBs and interior air vapor uh, control layers. He still performs energy assessments and audits, but it has added code-compliant blower door testing to the mix. Uh, and he works in the field, mostly tiling, um, something he has done on all new homes he built um, was install tiles. Um, as well as some custom shower work, uh, bulk water management, and all that. He writes uh, articles dealing with cold climate construction, 
Um, most are on his blog at Northern Build Pro and has done several articles. I think one he just said launched today um, on Green Building Advisor. So Randy, Dan, welcome, and please do take it away. Thanks, Brett. Thank you, Brett. And I think I just need to be able to share my screen if, yep, there you go. All right, so Randy, can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, I can now, yep. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining me. Thanks for the introduction, Brett. Um, really, I just wanted to start with, you know, I think that this is such a confusing area and I just wanted to ask Randy first, you know, do we need vapor barriers? Uh, I, I guess it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty much what we're going to be diving more into today. Um, so many years ago, I actually in the, the picture on the slide right now, you know, I met Mike Holmes at a Rockwell sales meeting and really got talking with him. Great guy. Uh, he then asked me a simple question, and this was probably eight years ago. So it was quite some time ago. I've been really working on my building science knowledge since then. And he asked me the question, do you know what the purpose of a vapor barrier is? And I really stumbled my words because I, you know, I knew who I was talking to, a building science great like Mike Holmes. And then my reply at the time was actually per to prevent vapor from getting into the wall cavity. And he quickly corrected me and said it's solely for air infiltration. So my question that really followed was one that I still have today. And that question is, well, why do we call them vapor barriers or need a vapor barrier for that matter? And all we really need is an air barrier. So for the next hour or so, we're gonna be discussing this very question and getting deep into the building science on why you need a vapor barrier, and depending on climate too, uh, and air control layer. So um, I did just change the word from barrier to control layer, as that's really what we're gonna be discussing, how to control air and vapor, and not just stopping it completely. So this webinar is for education and collaboration. You know, we're always looking for future, um, uh, you know, information or anything that you guys would like me to bring up uh, on the Rockwell side. And that's something that we always are demanding in the industry, just to better build, build better homes. Uh, so before we get started, really just wanted to discuss the term vapor permeability. Uh, everything in the wall really re does re resolve or revolve around this simple term. So what is it? And the definition that I came across is actually, um, it's often referred to as breathability or vapor permeability describes a material's ability to allow water vapor to pass through it. If you think back to science class, you'll remember that water can take different forms, solid, liquid, or gas. So vapor permeability concerns uh, the water in its gas form. So if you look at the photo that's on the slide, there's some major air leakage coming from this, the wood logs and where the wall and ceiling meet, you know, you could see actually snow kind of uh, on the bottom of the joist for the front porch. And that's just from air leaking out of the top sill plate or the top plate and collecting and condensating on the back, on the bottom side of that really cold wood. Uh, so, you know, in this case, an interior vapor control would be doing a great job at controlling air leakage and really just drastically improving the uh, comfort and the energy efficiency of this cabin. So first, I just wanted to go over airflow through conventional bat insulation. The light density products on the market, like fiberglass, won't really reduce the flow of air very effectively. This is a big reason why we should all be, you know, considering a stonewall insulation. Beginning with the manufacturing of Rockwell, all of our products do utilize cross-directional fibers. So in other words, there's really no direct paths through the material uh, to lose our value with wind washing and things like that. And the thicker you go, the harder it is for that airflow to really occur while still being vapor open. So we, we have as much as five times the amount of actual material, which is one of the reasons why it seems like rock wool is more expensive than fiberglass, but you're actually buying more material and less air. So I'm sure that you all have installed or have witnessed an install of, of a stonewall product and can see how tight it fits in the wall. This drastically reduces the air movement alone within the wall cavities, reducing uh, uh, convection through the wall cavity. So currently we don't have any kind of craft-faced paper on our bats as we really do recommend a continuous air and vapor control if needed on the interior. Um, so, you know, 
the big thing with any any of these systems, any of the control layers, it's really continuity. And continuity is the most important part when you start talking more about this. So this is just a quick disclaimer because in these videos or in these webinars, we're gonna be talking about other products too or other materials. So by all means, just always make sure that you're referring to the manufacturer installation best practices when you're when you're actually installing these materials. So really I wanted to go over like what is a vapor barrier. And the biggest thing with this is really just you know, understanding what the vapor barrier is versus a vapor control layer, and then why do we need the vapor control, and then vapor open versus vapor closed assemblies, and then we'll have a little part that's gonna be will it fail. And I think that's kind of just a fun way of looking at different uh, wall assemblies, and then will it fail or not, just by based off of a, a woofy analysis. So to start it off, you know, what is the difference between a vapor barrier and an air vapor control? So Randy, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to kind of explain what the difference is there. Well, vapor barrier, of course, is just in, in the name itself, it's gonna stop um, the majority of any kind of air for, or moisture moving through the product. Um, a vapor control layer, well, it's similar, um, but the, a vapor control layer maybe doesn't stop. Maybe it allows some moisture to move back through the product, uh, such as that Intello that's, that's uh, on the photo there, that's that's actually one of my jobs. It's a uh, um, that's a smart vapor control layer. It's I, I see there's a little question in one of the boxes. Um, how how do they work in a northern zone? Well, they they work kind of similar no matter where you're at. If there's some moisture that ends up inside this wall cavity, um, that Intello or there's a couple other products uh, that are similar can sense that there's a higher moisture content and they actually open a little pore up to allow the moisture to leave. Um, it's it's a much better way than just using the, the six mil poly, which is gonna trap that, that product. It also is airtight. It's an airtight product, um, as long as it's taped uh, and installed correctly. Um, you can see the pillowing on that photo. That's uh, actually during a blower door test. So it, it does stop air. It's It, was, <laughs> it, it did a very mm -hmm. good job at, at that. Um, but of course, it's main product, why you would choose that product is is to allow moisture to move out of an assembly if it's higher content, let's say, inside the wall cavity. Yeah, and then when we start talking about, I think, uh, you know, vapor barrier codes, you know, we could start looking at the different codes and looking at what basically a vapor barrier is versus a vapor retarder in the term of a class one, a class two, or a class three. And you kind of see the ones that we're looking at right now for vapor barrier is going to be 0.1 perm or less and as randy uh said you know six mil poly is a vapor barrier it's going to fall into that apparently sheet metal is also i've never seen sheet metal on the inside as a vapor barrier but apparently that's also one um then we start looking at like climate zone five and i know many people fall into this that are that are uh listening so I'll kind of go over that and you could see what the codes are. And a lot of it is actually added ventilation to the exterior of your cladding. So then you could get into a class three vapor retarder. So that's gonna be, you know, up to 10 perms. That's two coats of latex paint. Uh, and that's gonna really help with your air tightness if you're, you know, doing this. But, you know, it's either ventilation or the starting, the beginning of using, using continuous insulation. And Randy, you know, I see on here that it's an R5 over a two by four wall or an R7 and a half over a two by six wall. So why is it actually more for a two by six wall versus a uh, two by four wall? It has to do with uh, uh, heat flow through the assembly. Um, and a two by six wall, you, you've got more in, interior insulation, which is gonna slow that heat heat through the, through the assembly. You're gonna need more exterior insulation to achieve or to maintain a, a, a temperature at the sheeting is, is the basic reason why. Yep, exactly. So that's where some of the codes actually don't make sense when it comes into the thermal code mm -hmm. versus the vapor barrier, vapor retarder code too. And Definitely. then if everybody wants to, you know, I'm sure that most of you probably know what uh, climate zone that you fall into, but here's a map. Uh, I personally, I'm out of uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, 
So I'm in climate zone five as well. And, you know, where I'm actually sitting right now is Kansas City, uh, Missouri. So I'm technically in climate zone four, but right on the border. And I've actually done some woofy analysis is for some builder, local builders here in this market. And what I found was actually that it's a lot more uh, climate specific that we need to look at too. So I think the woofy is a great way of kind of looking at, uh, you know, how that assembly is going to perform when it comes to moisture. And then, you know, we could build very tight and very efficient. However, if we really don't include how to build a durable home, we could be in trouble, you know, with more moisture sensitive building materials uh, being kind of normal practice now, we need to think about, you know, the drying potential of our wall assembly. And this is where a flow through assembly or vapor open assembly really comes in. So if you go into the, um, if you start looking at these two different uh, uh, wall assemblies that are on the screen now, you could see that the, the flow through assembly in the winter months is going to dry to the exterior. And then the in the summer months, it's going to actually dry to the interior and the, to the air conditioning. And that's just kind of how the 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 forces work on that wall assembly. So I like to say that it's a four season wall assembly, you know, going vapor open. But there are some common practices that we need to look into. Um, and you could see like our perfect wall assembly here is actually using continuous insulation with a rain screen system outboard. And then your air barrier could actually fall centralized on your OSB or plywood. And then you're going to do some bat insulation in, inside and a, uh, a drywall or, you know, interior finish inside. So and then, and Randy, I know you've had quite a bit of, um, you know, uh, uh, encounters with moisture sources. So I don't know if you want to kind of go over some of the different things that, that produce a lot of moisture in a home. Yeah, of course, this is a great list. Let's get you started. Um, one that I would include in my climate anyways, is, is we have a lot of attached garages um, and they're not always isolated the best from the home. And I, I, I've run into quite a few projects now where we're uh, doing energy audits and, and inspections for people where we've had moisture moving through the house that was coming from the garage space. And that's just from you know, it's conditioned, it's a little bit warmer in there. You pull a vehicle in, it's full of snow or ice or water, it drips off. Of course, that moves to a vapor, it elevates the, the humidity level inside that space, and it's just moving through the assemblies where, wherever. The worst I saw was uh, in a, a garage that had a living quarters above the garage, um, and the north, the entire north end of that assembly, the, the wall assembly was completely rotted. Uh, OSB was all black, it was running. 40, 50% moisture content in areas. Uh, it was basically oatmeal by the time I got there. And I've been 20 years of doing this that, yeah, that really made a mess. So um, that's one of the big, big sources that I see in my climate. But of course that, that list that Dan's got up is, yeah, it's pretty complete. That's definitely what you might see in a, in a typical home. Yeah, and one of the areas that I always think, you know, you know, we always put like, we look at the bathroom and I find that we always see a lot of water vapor in the air after a shower. Mm -hmm. But you can see it's actually pretty low on this list for how much, how many pints of, of water actually come out of that one shower. And one of the things is, you know, in a bathroom, you have a lot of really hard surfaces. So, and they're cold, they're colder than typically room ambient. So you're going to see more of that. So it does appear more, but if you look at like drying your clothes, uh, th now, this is like leaving your clothes out on a rack inside of your home, uh, you know, and I think that's that's a big area. Cooking. Cooking is a huge area for moisture. And I know Brett always um, on some of his social feeds always puts on, you know, the indoor air quality, too, from cooking. That's another big aspect for this. Uh, I've also seen homes in, in New England actually storing green wood in their basement and all that moisture just comes right out of it. So then we need to kind of look at, you know, the moisture sensitivity of different building materials. And I always like to bring up just the difference between plywood and OSB. And as Randy was saying earlier about like in the Intello product, the vapor control layers, you know, OSB and plywood is also going to vary in plywood, actually, because it doesn't have as much glue as OSB. It's actually going to increase in vapor permeance as the relative humidity increases. So you can see at like 75% relative humidity, 
uh, you know, plywood actually starts increasing in vapor permeability. And by the time it gets up to almost completely saturate, complete saturation, you're looking at about 30%, 30 perm rating. So that's pretty high. Uh, so I think just adding more moisture and these, so if you look, that's uh, building science, uh, dot com did this one and that's OSB on one side with no vapor control and plywood on the other with no continuous insulation in a northern climate and you can see you know and this again no drywall or anything else so it was just uh, with bad insulation in there too so you know I think that's a good picture just to see like the the potential for moisture on the back side of different materials and then when you start looking at just vapor permeance of various exterior insulations, because that's where, especially in the northern climate, your wall is wanting to dry outward. You know, we need to look at what that permeance rating rating is on the exterior. And let's say you do only use like, you know, one inch or two inches of XPS in, you know, Randy's area. And Randy, what what would have to happen basically in your climate if you put only one or two inches of XPS up with a vapor barrier on the inside? Yeah, the codes are going to require a class one or class two vapor retarder. retarder. Um, now you've got basically a, a dirty diaper. Um, you know, it can't dry in either direction, uh, yeah. which which can be an issue definitely if, if in in the right instance, right, right conditions. Uh, Any time of exterior wall leak, for instance, if that got into that assembly, you're it's not drying either direction. Yeah, and that's where you know I think that the code is going to you know. I'm hoping that, you know, it does start including more continuous insulation, but enough. And I think like in Randy's climate, and I'm going to talk Stonewall, you know, our value, but, or I guess our value in general on the exterior, you know, Randy climate zone seven, he's probably looking at about an R14 to R16 just on the exterior to keep the, the sheathing warm enough that you're never going to have that condensation risk. In a two but by six wall assembly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that being said, if you look at like the rigid mineral wool, which is the one of the photos that uh, Brett had up earlier, you're looking at the perm rating at even at two inches is 50, you know, three inches is 30. And you can see just how breathable that is. And if you remember back to what's a class one, class two, class three, you know, class three is below 10. So even some of the other ones that are below 10 are still technically a vapor retarder too. Um, and then as we kind of go over and, and I'll let Randy talk on this because these are mostly his pictures. Uh, but, you know, what are some of the different interior air and vapor controls that that you have in in, in Minnesota? Yep. Um, so I've, I've installed there's there's three smart vapor control uh, products on the market. Um, Intello is one. That's a German system. Um, Sega Matrix, that's Swiss. That's a second. Those two are very, very good products, but they're a little pricey. Um, more of the uh, price point installations are the Certainty Membrane um, is a great product. Um, like I said, more, it's, it's more affordable. And of course, this, the, the other picture is a six mil poly and that you're back to a, a vapor barrier um, rather than having something that can move some moisture out of the wall. Uh, I like working, I've worked, uh, um, like I said, I worked with all three products, that, that Sega Matrix or uh, Myrix and the uh, uh, Intello. Um, Pro Clima is the manufacturer. Um, they are very nice to install. Very tough products. You can't tear them. It's hard to punch a hole through them. Um, if you use their proprietary tapes, boy, do they stick. You don't. You don't want to get it in a bad position because it, you, you're not going to get it apart without tearing tearing something apart. Um, and and just they're they're to me anyways they're fun to work with. Uh, but I'm kind of weird that way. So. <laughs> um, there is another uh, uh, kind of a smart vapor vapor product, and that's uh, craft-based insulation. That is also a, a, a it'll move moisture back out of the product. Um, the problem with that product is how do you achieve if you're trying to achieve an air barrier um, using a, a, a vapor retarder? It, you're not going to get it. It won't. You can't seal it tight enough. Um, where these other products do work well for that. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that just the air tightness, you know, that that's where continuity really helps and having yes, it not yes. on every bat, but, you know, continuous on the interior. So that I think would be great also for like a remodel, uh, not just new construction, too, because a lot of times you're only disturbing the walls inside. 
so you could put the that air barrier up on the on the interior but then as we kind of look at more i guess new construction or if you're ever replacing siding you know i think there's other you know exterior there's a lot less penetrations going through and you know but there's also you know a lot well it's just easier to get continuity on the exterior you don't have you know outlet boxes every 6 to 12 feet you know a lot of just a lot easier to detail around too so uh randy would you mind just kind of going through the different kinds of exterior air control starting with just like the regular staple on which I'm sure, sure mechan mechanically attached uh tieback tie bar to two products there's a there's a lot of that in the market um there are some that are way better than others uh the tieback tie bar are two that are quite well or uh, good at, at what they achieve but you're still mechanically fa fastening these so you're either punching a bunch of holes with a staple which manufacturers kind of are discouraging they want to see you use a cap staple with that with their products to to fasten you're still penetrating the the product though um the fluid applied that's uh a, that's a little more rare at least in my market it's I, i've actually never seen anybody use that product um but i know how it works it's just a it's like a paint that you you roll on or spray on to uh osb or plywood or whatever your your exterior sheathing is one pro well, the, the self-adhered that's uh another good one um i actually used uh, a product a self-adhered product on my home my home's 1952 build and i've got board sheeting and i was replacing the siding and i wanted to uh to to try to do a good job with the air barrier on the exteriors and that that self-adhered is uh is a great product for that um it's a little tricky to work with it's like working with tape but it's three feet wide and 100 foot long rolls so you're I worked with it by myself, so I ran it all um, uh, horizontal, I mean vertical, um, mm -hmm. which uh, you're up on a ladder and you're trying to get top fixed and then you're trying to smooth it out as you go by. It's a little tricky. Once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad, but um, I definitely like the self-adhered. Then, of course, the uh, the adhered, the, 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 the paneled systems like Zip, and there's more manufacturers out than just Zip. There's, there's three of them. Zip is my favorite. Um, they've been around the longest. Uh, great product to work with um they're, they're they've got great training it, um i know i've had uh conversations with the factory reps um in my area that would be more than happy to come up and, and train crews on how to install their systems and their tapes and and the right product for the right right location um yeah another great product and all these are vapor permeable at some level i think the yeah. lowest is by, uh zip just because it is on an osb you're down Just, in that two and a half to, yeah. Um, Tyvek, I think, has got a perm rating of roughly 50, I believe, in that neighborhood. Um, the product that I use for self adhered which is uh, the giant tape, I, um, Henry Blueskin is the product that I use. I, I believe that's in the 30s. Yep, 30, um, 30, 30, 30 or 33. Something right in that. So it's still very vapor permeable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And then there's also one area that I'm going to say that you always need a vapor barrier, and that's really below grade, and that's to really stop the ground gases that are that are out there. So in this case, it's actually a 15 mil uh, termite and air uh, and vapor barrier. So I think this is great for the ground gases, but then also putting like a continuous insulation sub slab. You know, you want some termite resistance, and that's where. You know, a stone wool uh, rigid board is actually really good at doing below grade and getting, you know, especially in some of the higher termite zones. I know like where Randy, you are, it's more carpenter ants, uh, not so much termites. But, you know, even where I am in Kansas City right now or Pennsylvania at home, you know, we do have to we do have major issues with termites. So having that ground control and putting, you know, a rock product basically back in the ground it's going to eliminate a lot of the areas of issue of of potential issue with termite and other pests that are in there. So this is an area that I think that we could all agree that we do need a vapor barrier. And typically that assembly for below grade is going to be your crushed gravel, your uh, rigid mineral wool board, and then your vapor barrier would be on top of that. And then you just pour your slab right on top of that. So uh, Dan, you're saying. Um question here you know these mm -hmm. uh, uh carpenter ants and these termites they don't take up nests in mineral wool they do not yeah we did we did actual testing out in uh hawaii 
with 400 Firmicin termites, and they actually did not even want a, anything to do with our product when we locked them in a basically a little, I guess, a plexiglass box with rock wool and a bunch of sand. So they could still move around through the sand, and they ended up not using any of the, of the rock wool. And I have another, um, I have a slide that just shows, or I have that actual test data that I could send out uh, if that's something that's needed in the out there. It's also on, on our uh, website as well. So if, I'm sure that if you just Google search rock wool uh, termites, that white, white paper will actually come up, but we're five times less prone to termite damage than even pressure treated lumber. Thanks. Yep. And then, you know, I think Randy, like how are some, some of the ways to prevent condensation, you know, some of that risk? Uh, number one condensation problem is always air moving and, you know, getting air to move into an assembly, finding a condensing surface, especially in the winter months in my climate is, is huge. Um, that picture with the six mil poly, and I don't know if that's a wintertime event or summertime event. It, it, uh, in my climate, um, that would only happen if it was a lot of air conditioning going on. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the summer, yeah, that was the warm, warm climate. Yep, where you could get that, uh, the, the moisture, of course, is from the exterior moving inward and, and hitting a condensing surface, which happened to be the poly. And then, of course, it gets stuck in there, and, and then you've got all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's rare in my climate. I, I've never actually seen that, but again, I'm climate zone seven, so I, you know, I only have 350 cooling degree days a, a year, so it's, <laughs> the, the air conditioning doesn't run as often. Um, and of course, vapor open uh, uh, products like uh, the stone wool or uh, you know, fiberglass is vapor, uh, vapor open too, but again, that's not stopping air um, as much. Um, the smart vapor barriers, putting those up to make sure that we have an inward drying potential um, during certain part times of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then I think next we're going to go into like what vapor open, you know, some vapor open assemblies and then versus vapor closed assemblies. So really vapor open wall design begins with, you know, the drying potential, which is actually greater than the wetting potential. And that's just a great overall system. You can see it's about this assembly is going to be about 30 perm rating. And that's going to be with the plywood instead of the, the OSB on this for that perm rating of the actual uh, wall assembly at a higher relative humidity. Um, but the all the materials are vapor open. Now, that being said, you could use OSB still centralized and that's still fine because the, the vapor perme, perm rating of OSB is between three and six. So I think that's also just a really good, uh, you know, that's also a great system. So uh, Stonewall has perm ratings up to 90 and will not trap any kind of vapor and really just maximizing the drying potential. Uh, good wall design, as Randy said earlier, should never include two vapor barriers. And a flow through design really has, has zero vapor barrier. Um, but again, the vapor control layers, you know, are good. And you could have multiple air barriers are fine. Uh, and it's just more of a forgiving wall assembly and it's just increased drying potential. So then as we go into like vapor closed, you know, this is no drying potential, but there's also no wetting potential in theory. So this is all good, good uh, system. So this is pretty much, and you could use like a closed cell spray foam inside and foam board outside. You can kind of see the picture in the bottom right and then uh, the top right, that's kind of that system. There's no condensing point. The condensation will not fall in any kind of vapor closed product. So both of these insulation, it's going to be good. Uh, but again, you don't want that that diaper effect that Randy brought up with having an interior vapor control, uh, like the picture that's on there with the fiberglass bat and the uh, and the the XPS on the exterior polyiso. And it's also a pretty expensive wall assembly when done correctly. Um, you know, we also, as we're making things tighter, and this is a whole nother topic, but really looking at that, the not just the HVAC unit, but the air exchange handlers that we have and what we're including into our house. Um, but it is kind of that perfect wall assembly. And like I, I kind of brought this up earlier, but these are all the details that make up a really good, you know, durable and energy efficient wall assembly, beginning with the exterior cladding, and that could be anything. 
then you have your your rain screen system so that could be you know if you could use one buys you could use uh, you know metal channels you could use numerous things uh, and then it's going to be a, a stonewall board rigid on the exterior and it could go from one inch all the way up to five inches that we have now available uh, and then you would have your control your air control and your mo more importantly the water control barrier on behind the, the stonewall and then you would have your OSB or plywood and then your bad insulation and then your drywall and again this is a flow through design uh, you don't need to tape any of the seams on the exterior board product, mostly because, you know, it's vapor open. So taping the seams is is not going to do anything there. And then these are just uh, just to get into some of the reports that we do. This was actually climate zone four. And what this was was just like a good, better, best. So looking at the moisture load on the on the plywood or OSB, you know, for this, you know, the good we're going to say is the exterior cladding, your house wrap at 50 perm, uh, which is, you know, kind of like the staple on house wraps, then OSB or plywood, comfort bat R21, uh, and then drywall. So you can see what, how to read this graph, the Wolfie analysis is actually that brown line is the temperature that it is for the sheathing. So not the exterior, but the sheathing. In this case, because there is no continuous insulation, it's going to drop down below 20, you know, a couple times during the year. And that's when you see the moisture load on the back side of the OSB start elevating. Um, and the moisture graph is actually the green. So if you look at that, you know, that's where you have a threshold line, which is like the dotted red line. And that's going to be where you could have mold. And it would actually appear on that with a black dot if there's potential for mold. So even though that this, you know, doesn't use continuous insulation, doesn't use an interior vapor control. Now, if you put this in Randy's climate, you would definitely need uh, a vapor control layer on the interior wall with the lower perm rating of seven. So meaning, you know, one of the, the smart membranes or, you know, one of those would be good, but you could also use a poly. And that's that's where you, you are gonna need a vapor barrier um in a colder climate here but climate zone four at least you don't then as we start integrating the the uh the exterior insulation you can see that the sheathing is actually starting to you know get less moisture on it and the the temperature of the sheathing goes from about 20 to just dipping right below 40 degrees so you're actually keeping the sheathing warmer just with the interior heat collecting on the hitting the back side of the sheathing and then the best and this is climate zone four uh, but also this would work great and be very similar in climate zone five and climate zone six and even in climate zone seven it would look really good so you could see how much more stable temperature stable that osb is and you know that that moisture curve does not even go above the threshold so that's looking at like your dew point and other you know calculations for moisture uh, and then this is kind of a just a fun one that I Randy actually sent and Randy do you want to explain like kind of this This picture that of the car wash. Yep, that's uh, and of course a vapor drive uh, summer or wintertime moving through a block wall it's grabbing the salts and the, the, the stuff that's in the concrete blocks and and it's ending up on the exterior of the building uh, you can't see it but underneath those windows the uh, the grout joints are pretty much gone on that building they've all deteriorated to the point where they're, they're not there and I, I'm assuming that's because of a freeze thaw cycle you know and there's periods in in uh, where I live where this building is located where the, the, the temperatures don't get above freezing for three four months sometimes um, of course that high moisture content in those blocks uh, that freeze thaw cycle tends to not be great for them and of course the reason it's such a high moisture content is just because of where what it is it's a car wash so you know there's 100 percent humidity i'm sure at times inside the structure and and that's trying to get to that dryer outside uh mm -hmm. air and, and move into the block yeah and that's where you know i was helping a, a designer in minneapolis doing a terrarium and for that even though that they were using continuous insulation, their best bet was actually not allowing that moisture to get into that wall mm -hmm. assembly. And that we, we, they ended up using six mil poly with really good results. 
So it, it depends on the project, it depends on where it is. You know, we have this climate zone discussion all the time, and that's where the Woofie really does help because we pinpoint the actual address and we can see, you know, where that is. If you have 20 mile an hour winds all the time on top of, you know, Mount Washington, or I should say 140 mile an hour winds at times, you know, you need to look for all that because even though you're in climate zone five, let's say, at the top of the mountain, you're going to be at a completely different climate. Um, just like in a valley or, you know, there's many different things in indoor uh, temperature and relative humidity. So if you're somebody that sets your temperature at 60 degrees, you're going to actually have less risk than if you're setting it at 72 degrees and with a deep, with a humidifier, you know, in the winter months, you're going to have a lot more heat and moisture load inside of the building. Um, that's going to cause, you know, potentially more issues than if it was a lower temperature and you had like a 20% relative humidity in the home. And then just wanted to go through kind of, you know, the do's and don'ts of vapor barriers. And I think, you know, a big one is really just including a continuous air barrier. Uh, add multiple air barriers. If you want to do, you know, your WRB as an air barrier and also an interior air barrier, I think that's great practice. It's just more areas to kind of stop that that air from going through your wall assembly. Uh, Randy, uh, blower door tests. I mean, that's something that you work a lot on. And can you kind of explain that process? Sure. Um, blower door test, what we're doing is we're testing the tightness and the integrity of the uh, air control layer, um, wherever that is, whether it's on the exterior or interior, um, sometimes both. Uh, and of course, there's codes that mandate now where, where we need to be as long as you have code enforcement. Um, in my climate, that's uh, we need to have three, and I think that three air changes per hour um, at the test pressure of 50 pascals. And that's all the way down into Texas, I believe. You have to get into southern Texas before you the, the uh, rate goes up to five air changes per hour. Um, Florida, of course, that's at five. Um, but yeah, it's just, a, it's just a test where we're testing the uh, continuity and the integrity of the uh, air control air. Yeah, and like that 5 ACH50, that means that basically with a 20 mile an hour wind hitting your house, your air changes or your entire air volume of your home changes five times in an hour. So that's pretty at, hot. At the test pressure, yeah, when you're running the test. Um, yeah, right. And naturally, in my climate, that that three air changes per hour test, um, that ends up being, if you if you were to get exactly three on your blower door test, that equates to roughly 0.2 air changes naturally okay so every once every five hours in my climate once every five hours naturally you're changing your all your interior air with exterior air you think when it's 20 30 below that's what's happening do you really want to be at three air changes per hour <laughs> so yeah yeah well that's just high pressure and low pressure you know high pressure moving into low pressure areas and that's where it your house yeah, it could be wind. Um, wind is also a, has an effect, but that stack effect that you're talking about, the, mm -hmm. the difference between inside and outside temperature, we get that air moving inside and um, yeah, we, we end up pushing it up through the, in the wintertime, through the higher assemblies and it comes into the lower areas and yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. And then we kind of get into the don'ts. And I think the big one is don't have more than one vapor barrier. So understand the perm ratings of your wall assembly, all the components that go into it, and making sure you're only using one vapor barrier and that it's on the right side of the wall for your climate. Uh, and then also, you know, when you're remodeling, I think this is a big area that, you know, if you're, let's say, you know, residing your home and you want to use continuous insulation, but you don't know what's on the interior, you know, you want to make sure that you're using vapor open products on the exterior just to eliminate any kind of risk that you might have. Um, and then looking at like the flash and bat system, which is another good remodel system, but you need to know how much foam, uh, and this is closed cell spray foam, is enough for your climate. So there's a little graph there and it kind of tells you, but primarily, you know, and there was some, I know there's some uh, videos online with some remodels that basically went bad just because they didn't have enough of that uh, closed cell spray foam and they had major moisture on the back side of the the foam itself so again it's not going to really get into the foam but it's going to be on the back side of it and then if you have like a fiberglass bat it'll just absorb it like a sponge 
Um, and then this is kind of the fun game. You know, we're going to look at different wall assemblies and see for ourselves. And we're also going to look at it at different climates. So, Randy, uh, because I think the first one is is going to be for you. Now, yours, we are using a a uh, vapor control layer on the inside. So it's drywall, then vapor control layer, uh, then stonewall bat at R15, so two by four wall, which again, won't even be to code in your climate. Mm -hmm. uh, plywood, self-adhered WRB and vinyl siding. So what do you think that report with, again, with the vapor control on the interior? Um, well, I wouldn't install it in my climate. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, so it does work. And again, that's primarily because you do have that interior vapor control stopping yeah. all that moisture from getting to the sheathing. So you can see that that graph and you have plenty of days below, well below zero. And even with that properly placed vapor barrier, vapor control yeah. layer, you know, you actually it, see that. It works. It works. Um, the, the, the issue is uh, that you're probably not going to be real comfortable in that house. Right. <laughs> You'll be heating it a lot. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> and then this was actually Kansas City, uh, Missouri. So you can see this is, again, without a vapor barrier at all. So no vapor control, just the assembly that's up there, your drywall with two coats of latex paint, your stonewall bat, your plywood, your self-adhered house wrap. And you can see, again, it's going above that threshold line. But it's really going to drop right back down and no, no issues with mold or anything. And then the last one is actually Climate Zone 3, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And you can see there's absolutely no issues with that. You see a much tighter uh, graph. Uh, you know, it does get above 100 degrees, you can see, for the sheathing. And that's actually when it's drying out on the on the interior of the sheathing. But you could get some on the, like, if you did have a poly up, that's when you would see some of that moisture on the backside of the poly. Next one, we're, gonna, we're just going to start use, using continuous insulation. So this is the same basic assembly. Except I believe in uh, yeah in Minnesota in Climate Zone Seven we did not go with any kind of interior vapor control. We were relying simply on that staple on house wrap as the primary air barrier, and we did two inches of uh, rigid mineral wool on the exterior, and that's basically what that craft looked like. And then for again for Kansas City. So all these are all very safe. As again, utilizing that continuous insulation, I think, is a very uh, Im important part for your wall assembly durability. Uh, and then this is kind of a fun one. So we actually can put air leakage through the poly. And this was, uh, again, it's International Falls. So even how far north of, of you is International Falls, Randy? Uh, about 90 miles. 90 miles. So pretty close. Uh, but it is hovering along the Canadian border. And what we did here, we did, uh, you know, just regular drywall, six mil poly, dense pack, but the poly had air leakage through it. Um, then we had OSB, staple on house wrap, one inch of XPS. And Randy, how do you think this performs again with the air leakage through the poly? That's a ris risky assembly. Yeah. So this is an assembly we highly do not recommend. And you can see that black line of mold just growing on everything. So again, that's where, and Randy, how would we change this assembly to make it better? Um, uh -huh. Make it airtight or increase that exterior insulation. Correct. Yeah, and I think that's the big one, especially when you're using non-permeable products on the exterior. So then we did the same exact thing, but we just replaced the, the cellulose and the XPS with stonewall products. Six mil, same with air leakage and everything. Uh, but it's again, it's vapor open throughout the entire thing until you hit that interior, but you have that air leakage. And with that one, you do see it go above threshold, but again, there's min you're minimizing your risk. Mm -hmm. So that's really kind of what I wanted to get at on these two slides, just minimizing your risk when you're looking at vapor open products. And then this is the same exact two, two wall assemblies but without any air leakage and i think this is a big part when it comes to you know a woofy analysis versus job site and how it is to install and you know is that homeowner down the road going to put in a medicine cabinet on the exterior wall you know or penetrating through that that vapor barrier that six mil poly you know that's going to prevent all these kind of leaks in that system 
So, and then again, with the, the, the Stonewall solution, you can see it's well below threshold the entire life. Uh, the Woofy, these tests were for five years and we could go anywhere from three to five years. Does not put climate change into the, the matrix, the metrics though, um, as we're seeing warmer. And then Randy, this, this I think is just a great picture and this is from you. So I don't know if you want to explain this. So that's a uh, an HRB unit in a new construction um, site that I was involved with, and the house was under construction. It was I looked this temperature up. I think it was about zero. It was shortly after Dan came up to visit this site. Um, in December, uh, windy. Um, it's close to a lake, so we had some pretty good wind coming across the lake, which was. Um, taking that moisture, which was actually, it was the HRV wasn't hooked up yet. It was just open pipes that ran to the outside. And we were taking some of that interior moisture loading from the new construction. It was moving out the pipes and smearing across the side of the, the siding, which ended up being a fun picture to take. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Randy. And thank, you. thank you to everybody for joining. I think, uh, Brett, I'm not sure if there was anything that kind of came in. Questions? Uh, sorry, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, yeah, we got some questions and we've got some time. You guys got some time to stick around for some questions mm -hmm. a little bit longer? Yeah. Great, great, yeah. So um, real quick before we get to those questions, for those of you looking for your continuing ed, um, take the survey that pops up at the end when we close out if you miss it. It'll be sent to you in an email. Check your spam for customer care at gotowebinar.com. Take that survey. Even if you don't need CUs, we want to hear from you. If you're watching this in the future, not right now on demand, take that quiz either on the USGBC or Thinkific platform, get an 80% passing rate, and then you can pick up your CEU certificate. And a huge thanks to all of our sponsors, um, Mitsubishi, our top tier, Ream, Build Equinox, Serve, helping you uh, build better, uh, higher performing homes and thanks to our board of directors volunteers everyone who allows us to do what we do um, there were some questions here uh, and a lot there a lot of commentary oh, that's for sure a lot of good commentary <laughs> and dialogue and I've been kind of kicking that some of that back to everyone so they can see it um, there was a question about the the tape um, on the zip systems with just issues of it being installed properly, I think with rolling or not rolling. I don't know if you see anything like that, Randy, or if that affects um, moisture issues or not. It can. Um, I to, to really do it correctly, of course, you want to take the training from Huber to make sure that that, that that you're doing it right. But you need to really need to wipe the 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 uh, panel down. A lot of times, there's some dust that. It, can get adhere to the panel and that tape won't quite adhere right so um, and of course rolling rolling is key to to almost any um, pressure sensitive adhesive whether it be a WRB the you know the um, the the, the uh, uh, self full, fully adhered um, or the uh, zip systems the tapes um, even on the interior um, if, if you look at the directions you really need to roll all, all the tapes yeah, and you could even get a good air barrier by simply doing plywood or OSB mm -hmm. and taping those seams too. Yep, and there are also vapor open tapes that are available. Um, most of them that I'm aware of are from Europe. There probably are some from the United States that I'm not aware of, but um, yeah, if you're worried about uh, wanting some more vapor openness on your tape seams, that's a, that's a option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Considering capillary forces, why aren't we spraying the top of our footing before the wall pour to prevent this? And then a comment on that is poly is now too difficult with all the rebar. Um, I mean, I have seen people spray uh, or roll on a product on the to, to, to limit capillary. Um, of course, Sil Seal will also help with that it, not quite as good as a as a roll-on but it'll help um i like the sill seal um and then using a uh, uh a mastic or a uh um what's that called the uh the acoustic caulking yep the acoustical caulking uh the stephen bazak detail where you you put a bead or two on the bottom and a bead on top you put your board on top of that squish it down and that should stop your capillary and it's also in your air control area it'll, it'll 
limit the air moving underneath that board. So that I'm a fan of that. And even to kind of belt and suspenders approach to that also is adding tape to the exterior between yes. your foundation to your sill plate. Or tape or even a fluid applied. Um, or a fluid applied, yeah. Yep. Yep. I think we're going to have to do a another session here on the uh, the smart vapor control systems uh, or products because uh, we've seen a couple of questions. Uh, kind of just repeat questions uh, for, at the beginning and now at the end, still trying to wrap their brain around how do these smart VC layer systems work? I mean, can you try to articulate it a little bit more? It's uh, based on relative humidity. So uh, basically they open up when it gets more humid and that's the way that I kind of understand it. The, the Intello, I believe there's a salt that's impregnated into the, uh, um, the, the, the material itself. And when that salt becomes wet is what actually somehow opens or, to, you know, makes it easier for moisture to move through is, is my understanding of it. Um, again, that's the, I'm, I think that came from Instagram or something. So I, 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 I don't know if I put a lot of salt into it, but it's, it's yeah. what I understand of it. Yeah. Well, this is, I think it's, uh, I think it's definitely something I need to follow up on and I want to learn more about myself. So mm -hmm. thanks for bringing it up. Um, in the case of closed attic systems and low slope roof assemblies, what type of insulation is preferred to keep the attic space dry and avoid mold growth? So if you're looking at basically conditioned attics, you know, there's some different options, rock wall option or stone wall options that you could put continuous insulation on top of the roof that we've seen. I've been seeing it a lot more recently. Uh, and all over the country. So it really depends on the climate, but you know, I'd say climate zone five, you're looking at four to five inches, maybe six inches of the rigid mineral wool on top and then cavity. And it's all about the ratio there. So in the North, you want about 60%. Randy, is it it's 60% on top and yes, then 40% yes. in the cavity? Yes. yes, in my climate, yes. Yeah, so, and as you move South, you could start reducing that amount. And again, it's all because condensation on the on the roof sheathing um and and what about in the in the in the case of um existing buildings and in fact this goes to another question about um you know if you're taking the siding off and putting an insulation on the exterior um you know where are you putting that vapor system what should you use so yeah speak to you know uh, renovations a little bit yeah so i mean i kind of alluded to it earlier but you know that's where i think the vapor openness really does help because you could do a good you know i i the self-adhered house wraps i've seen really good success with and in a remodel when you're removing the siding you know you have all that exposed osb or plywood you just put a self-adhered or basically the three foot by a hundred foot roll of tape around that's still vapor open. And then you could put how much of the comfort board uh, on your, on the exterior, fur it out and then put your siding up. Uh, one of the kickbacks that I, I hear about is actually like compression. And that's something I hear quite a lot. And Randy, I know he's, he's installed, you know, the, the rain screen system. And I think it was LP smart side on his. And how, how was the compression for you? When you were it's, installing, it's not that bad. It, it, once you get used to working with the system, you you know you get a long level, you know six, eight, ten foot level or straight edge, and mm -hmm. you just back those screws in or out to to make the surface flat. It isn't that hard. Yeah, and that's something also that we offer at Rockwell is you know that job site training as well. Mm -hmm. so, but it, again, once you get a couple in, you're like, oh, this is this is good. Yeah. Um. So what about, uh, you know, the cost of wood is is going through the roof, OSB, uh, everything. And we're looking at alternative systems. Um, and what are some of the concerns or opportunities, uh, you know, for these systems if we're using something like uh, prefabricated metal, right, buildings that are being turned into homes or s stone or something else? Right. So, well, the biggest issue with metal is thermal conductivity. You know, our frying pans are made out of metal for a reason to cook with. You're not making wooden pans. There's other options, you know, issues for that. Um, but that's where I think continuous insulation is that much more uh, important with those those builds. I think there's also a, a play uh, with 
just having a, a more simple wall design instead of doing, let's say, a staggered stud, you know, double stud system, which doubles the amount of lumber. You could actually reduce that lumber by just simply using like a, the continuous insulation on the outside and even use a two by four interior wall to keep that sheathing a little warmer, but just adding more to the exterior because typically labor costs, whether you're doing an inch and a half or three inches of continuous insulation, the labor itself, other than the weight of the product is going to be about the same because it's still one time around that house. Mm -hmm. Any comments on there, Andy? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think you covered it pretty good. There's, you know, I've had a uh, few builders approach me about replacing sheeting. You know, how, how what, what's a better option? There, there actually is one builder in my area that's moving to board sheeting, mm -hmm. uh, which you would think would be expensive, but they're buying seconds or you know the 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 cheaper wood, a number three, um, and and using that product. Again, how do you achieve an air tightness when you've got all those little gaps going through? So you've got to address that. Um, uh, the other one is out of the commercial end. I've seen some gypsum, some qu people questioning whether they can use gypsum on, on the mm -hmm. um, exterior. It, again, it's a commercial mm -hmm. application. I, I, you'd really have to check with your inspector and, and some other, pro you know, the engineers to make sure that it's going to work <laughs> residential. I don't know if I'd use it, but people are desperate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do all self-adhered membranes have higher perm ratings? Example, uh, grace, ice, and water. So grace, ice, and water, to my knowledge, is a, almost a zero perm rating. Yes. That's a vapor barrier. Yep. Um, the It's not the adhesive or the ad, ad, adhering. It's actually more in the material itself. So there's a couple like, uh, you know, there's Delta, there's uh, Henry. And they're all going to have different perm ratings. And depending on where you are in the country, you might want a higher perm rating or even a lower perm rating if you're in like Texas. Or your cladding choice. Um, or, you know, yeah. if, if you're if you're using a, a, a stucco or a, a brick veneer, you're going to want a lower perm rating on, on your WRB at that point. Hmm. Um, you had uh, mentioned earlier, I really like that slide you'd put up of other considerations, you know, not just the climate zone that you were in, but blower door testing, extreme climates. You know, Randy, you were telling me right before this call about how up where you were this year, you said uh, the most time on record spent below zero. Is that right? You were saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your area. So what should, you know, builders be considering when we know that our temp, you know, our climate is getting more extreme in many different ways, colder, hotter, wetter, drier. Um, you know, should they be looking at potential studies of what's going to be happening in their area, area and pre-building for that? Or have you seen for me, I, like that or, yeah. I would at least start considering it a little bit. You know, in my area, it's it, I would say 80 to 90 percent of all the buildings that are being built, and the new new residential construction is still using polyethylene as our you know vapor air control air. Um, I, I, in my opinion, we should be moving away from that and, and, and at least moving to the smart vapor control, you know, whether you put exterior insulation on or not. In our, in my area, the, the Minnesota, the state of Minnesota rewrites the codes where um, they're not allowing us to, or they don't re recommend us putting exterior insulation on unless you know what you're doing. You know, the, the, the code where R5 on a two by six wall, that's not, Minnesota doesn't even consider that in my climate zone. Matter of fact, they don't say anything about exterior insulation. The only thing they say is an R20, maybe it's an R20 wall assembly is what, what we need to achieve. Um, so, you know, going through uh, what's going to happen in the future, how these homes are going to, are they going to last? Are they going to make it, are these going to make it 100 years? You know, I'm in a house that's 70 years old. It, it, it breathes fine. I, I got 13 air changes with the blower door number. I have no problems with, yeah. with it drying. <laughs> um, but it, it, in the same sense, in these new, newer homes where you've got two air changes per hour, how is that poly um, going to affect the home long term? Or we, we should really get some way to dry, dry these walls out if, yeah. if they do become wet. Well, and I even remember, so I, I actually grew up or I was born and grew up until I was 10 years old in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Hmm. And 
we didn't have an air conditioner in her in her house and i guarantee you that the house is now built in in west bloomfield michigan have air conditioners because it has been getting warmer and warmer and colder and colder in the winters mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i i didn't i grew up over here on the other side <laughs> yeah. you know no no ac um but it was hot so <laughs> Well, every new home built in my climate right now is getting AC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of crazy, you know. It's but it's for those couple of hot days here, right? <laughs> yeah, coming. it's gonna be 90 this weekend, and yeah, they'll they'll that's you know, it's not normal for us to get 90 in this early in June. You know, it's mm. Something we gotta well, live with. Huh? I mean, what you know, from a mechanical standpoint, um, what. I mean, does it come into the conversation with some of these systems when you're designing for them? Or Dan, you kept referencing Woofy as a great tool for not only looking at energy loss through passive house, but these moisture issues. Um, but from a mechanical system standpoint, looking at you know dehumidifiers, humidifiers, ERVs, HRVs, ventilation. You know, how does that play into when you're designing these systems, or is it really just Put your efforts here in the shell first, and then those will kind of take care of themselves. If if you can get the shell done correctly, um, it can dry. A lot of it's going to be taken care of. Of course, if you open windows out and it's 90% humidity outside, it's 90%, and it doesn't matter. You know, it's right. Nice right. It yeah. um, but I've got a couple of houses I'm working on right now that are they have damp basements. I've actually got one where I have a summertime condensation issue on a vaulted ceiling so this vaulted ceiling drips in the summertime this time of year um it's got a dark colored roof we can't figure out why it's doing it um it, it's a very unique situation and the way that i the only way i can see to solve it is that moisture loading is coming from the basement there, it's an older basement it was built in the mid 80s they didn't do the right kind of um you know water management system it, it gets damped down there that's working its way up to the system it's, it's through the assemblies and getting up to that ceiling um so limiting with a dehumidifier that moisture load from the basement or getting air circulating all the time to to stir that where it's getting very very humid right at the bridge um to to, to stir that up that's our two solutions um randy was at home uh like a log log cabin it's, or it's a log cabin yes yeah so is that new or was that an older home? Built well, in 1985. 85 yeah, so I had a similar thing in uh, Hamburg, Pennsylvania with the log home. And I think it's just the moisture of all that, the logs that they get wet and it just dries to the oh, inside and all that humidity. Coming kinda... out of the uh, winter time, that's when they should be their driest. And right? we're experiencing yes. that in June you know, early in the season, the heating season. So I'm thinking that's coming out of the ground more than out of the log. I could see it happening late in the season, August, September, after we've had a full summer of okay. higher humidity where it would absorb that moisture. But you're right, yeah. it, could, it could be. Maybe it is it, something it, like that. For this one, it was a new construction log home, 9,000 square feet. In the basement, the relative humidity was like uh, uh, 40%. So, you know, pretty well, normal in yeah. Then on the first floor, it was like 60%. And on the second floor, it was actually 85%. Wow. Yep. So it was a very hu huge difference. And it was all just collecting at the top. Damp rising. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Well, great. Um, you know, I, I don't see any other questions here right now. But, uh, you know, Dan, Randy, thanks again. Dan, good to have you back out. Good to see you virtually out there. Yeah. I uh, hope they catch up in person someday here soon. So, um, but uh, where can people go just to learn more or contact you to get more information? Um, so myself personally, my email address is right on the screen. My phone number is as well. Uh, you could go to rockwell.com, uh, but I could also just send you links to exact pages or like that termite report, uh, anything like that. I think that's the best. Uh, now that Instagram, I think has been such a great part of everything. I'm at a, uh, at, at Dan Edelman RW, and you could follow me there. You know, we could communicate there as well. So, and then I'll, Randy. Um, I have a, uh, a blog that I write, uh, it's at www.northernbuilt.pro. Um, mm -hmm. And then again, I'm on Instagram. That's it's one word, Northern Built Pro. Great. Randy, Dan, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, have a great rest of your week, everyone. Take care. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Have a great one. Take care. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.